I want to welcome you this morning to City of God. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. Great to have you with us. Uh, as hard as it is to believe, we are in August. So uh, if you've been around, you know this is a big month for us as a church. About two weeks from now, uh, the other 50% of the church is going to show up, uh, which is awesome. And we look forward to that. Uh, but we're excited uh, about what's coming. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 30 this morning. So if you have a Bible and want to turn there, Proverbs 30. Uh, if not, you can look up on the screen. Uh, we'll have the verses there. Uh, this Saturday, just one reminder, our men's ministry is hosting a nine-hole golf outing at Battleground Golf Club. Uh, you can sign up for that on our website, cogchurch.org, or register on the app. And I know they'd love to see you there, and there's a few spots left. So... Proverbs 30. Now, as we get into this this morning, let me just preface this by saying, uh, I'm not proud of the story I'm about to tell you. And when I say that, toward the end of my time at Bible college, I was having a conversation with a few of my close friends about how we were going to celebrate graduation. What could we do uh, just to be glad and just to enjoy the fact that we were done? And so we were sitting around a lunch table at McDonald's, and it was at that moment the idea for, and I'm already apologizing for it, Gluttony Fest was born. Now, here's what that was, and I'm going to be doubly honest. I lied to first service and said it was called Fast Food Fest, and my wife was like, you need to own it. Just don't you tell second service what it was. So if you see first service, correct me. This was, is gluttony a sin? Yes. Did we mean it in a sinful way? No. Did it need better branding? Probably. Here was the idea that we would all have a set amount of money and on a particular day go to all our favorite fast food restaurants and get as much of our favorite things as we could and we would bring them all back to my apartment and we would spend the entire day, and here was the goal, if there was something you wanted to eat, it was available and you could have as much as you wanted of it. And so we did that. We went and we got all the food and we got back to my apartment and we uh, wanted to class up this event a little bit. And so we took the time to build uh, a pretty impressive pyramid out of everything we had purchased. And so the pizza boxes were a good base with the cheesecake and then you had the KFC buckets on top and then you could stack the burgers up and do a little taco tower above everything else. And Jesse's not the only artistic person in our family. I can do stuff like that too. And so we did all of this. I don't know how, we, we all had wives at the time, and they were way too supportive of this. And so uh, they were willing to help us out with it. And the, 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 the timer for the day was this. We were all really into, there was a college basketball video game for the Xbox. We all played a lot. We made a 16-team tournament. We spent way too much time on this. And the goal was to play through the whole thing, and when the tournament was done, Gluttony Fest would be over. So we started, and for the first few hours, it was awesome. We were eating fast food, hanging out, playing video games. About halfway through, we realized we need to move a little bit because we feel terrible. So we went to the mall and walked around for an hour, which was our favorite pastime. We got some Orange Julius's to give us the calories we needed to get through the day. And so we did that. We went home. We had the rest of the day. And as you can imagine, by the end of the day, um, it was a pretty sad sight in my apartment. The wives did show up to us just sluggish and tired and just, it wasn't the excitement that they had seen at the beginning of the day. And that was a day we experienced the reality of the saying, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing or you can have too much of a good thing. This applies not just to fast food, it applies to everything. You can have too much of a good thing. It applies to sleep. It applies to entertainment. It applies to anything in this life. Too much of it can be detrimental to us. And as we open the book of Proverbs this morning, this might sound like a surprise, it reveals to us too much wealth can be a detrimental thing. Now, I know we're getting a little nervous already, just but Proverbs throws out this idea that too much of anything can be a bad thing if we're not careful. You see this in Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs chapter 30, we're reading the words of a man named Agur, who we haven't run into in Proverbs yet. Uh, but chapter 30 is his wisdom, his contribution to the book of Proverbs. And he writes this, two things I ask you. Deny them not before I die. This is his prayer to God. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. 
And so Agur, in this prayer to God, he comes to God and he asks for two things. One, remove falsehood and lying from my life. He wants to walk in the truth. He wants to speak truth. But secondly, he asks God, give me neither poverty nor riches, which sounds like an odd prayer request. Here's why he makes it. He recognizes both extremes, both situations, being wealthy or being poor, both present unique spiritual dangers to us if we're not careful. If Agar was too wealthy, he prayed, I might be tempted to forget about my need for God. However, if he didn't have enough, he might be tempted to curse God for not giving him what he needed to survive. So in Proverbs 30, it's not just that too much of a good thing can be a problem. We also discover too little of a good thing can be a problem when it comes to our financial lives. We're in the final two weeks of our sermon series through Proverbs. Pastor TJ will be up next week looking at friendship and what Proverbs teaches us about that topic. But over the course of the past few months, Proverbs has been trying to teach us how to live wisely. It's been trying to give us wisdom for life. And over and over, Proverbs has been encouraging us, pursue wisdom. Life is difficult. It's complicated. We need God's help if we're going to navigate it well. We need God's wisdom to teach us what He wants for us and from us. And we have to act on that wisdom. And when we act on God's wisdom, we become wise. This is how we find life is the promise of the book of Proverbs. And we've seen Proverbs touch on some of the most ordinary aspects of life. It's talked to us about how we use our words and being humble and our emotions and our relationships and our sexuality and a host of other issues. Again, this book wants to teach us how to honor God in just the mundane, ordinary aspects of life. And there are few topics where we need wisdom more than when it comes to this topic of our money, and our finances. And what you discover in the book of Proverbs is actually a pretty nuanced view on the topic. Depending where you are in the book of Proverbs, you might begin to feel like Proverbs actually contradicts itself when it talks to us about our financial reality. But when you bring all of this truth together, you actually find a pretty cohesive idea that helps us navigate this area of life really well. And the first thing we see in Proverbs when it comes to the topic of our uh, prosperity or our financial situation is this. Proverbs does teach us financial wealth can be a gift from God. Proverbs 8, 17 through 21, we find this is wisdom speaking to us, personified as a woman. But she says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Again, if you weren't with us when we were in Proverbs 8, this is wisdom speaking to us. And what's her promise? If you will pursue me, if you find wisdom, riches and honor are with me. As a general principle, the book of Proverbs suggests if you follow its wisdom, you will prosper financially. And that makes some of us really nervous especially anything that sounds like or hints at something like a prosperity gospel. Believe in God and financially everything will be okay. But the wisdom that Proverbs is offering us at this point is far from that. Proverbs is simply suggesting if you will follow our wisdom, if you will follow my wisdom in Proverbs for your financial reality, it will likely be a good thing for you. Because here's the wisdom that Proverbs offers. First and foremost, if God's people are willing to work hard and work diligently, more often than not, they will prosper. For example, Proverbs 10.4, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A couple chapters later in Proverbs 12.11, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. 
Again, the wisdom that Proverbs offers here isn't earth-shattering. If people are willing to work and work hard, they will prosper. And working hard is a good thing in the wisdom of Proverbs. Now, one thing we need to clarify before we go further is when we talk about prosperity, we need to differentiate between what we think prosperity looks like in our culture and what prosperity actually is in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, I think it's this, that God will give us what we need to live the life he's calling us to live, not necessarily to match a certain standard of living or prosperity. And so again, if we're diligent, if we work hard, Proverbs says, you'll flourish. You'll have what you need to live the life that God wants you to live. And typically this happens by working hard and being diligent over a long period of time. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. The wisdom of Proverbs is not a get-quick-rich scheme. It's not a lottery ticket. It's the wisdom of working hard, being faithful, being wise with the resources that God has given you. And Proverbs says, over time, if you will do those things and be diligent in those things, you should prosper. Now, as we say that, we also recognize in Proverbs 8 that it reminds us that while prosperity might come to those who are wise, it's not the most important thing that comes to those who are wise. Ultimately, wisdom brings what? Righteousness and justice, she tells us in Proverbs 8. And these things are better than gold in the language of Proverbs 8. Wealth is a good thing in Proverbs. It's not the ultimate thing, though. And it's a good gift that God can give us so that we can help meet the needs of the people around us. I love the imagery of Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 on this point, where we read, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another, with, <clears throat> another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs tells us if you do prosper, you can either use the gifts that God has given you primarily for selfish reasons, or you can use the gifts that God has given you for the good of others and those around you. And what we see is Proverbs telling us to imagine our resources like water in a pitcher. And it's asking the question, are you only pouring that water into your own thing you put a plant in that I can't think of the name of right now? Or everyone else's? How are you distributing the good things that God has given you? Are you taking care of the needs of the family that God of the family that God has given you? Are you taking care of the needs of the people around you and the needs that you see in your own life? One of the things we discover in the New Testament is this: the Apostle Paul had some really harsh words for Christians who don't work hard and don't provide for the needs of those closest to them. 1 Timothy 5.8, he reminds Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's a strong statement. If the thing that is keeping you from providing for your own needs or the needs of those around you, if the thing keeping you from that is laziness, we discover that is a sin that needs to be repented of. But I want to pause here for a second because it would be easy to misunderstand Proverbs at this point. Proverbs doesn't paint with a broad brush and say, if you're rich, it's because you worked hard, and if you're, la- or if you're poor, it's because you're lazy. Life is more nuanced than that. Proverbs is more nuanced than that. We can all think of people who are insanely rich and didn't have to work that hard for it. And we can all think of people who work really hard and have little to show for it. And trying to understand the wisdom of Proverbs on wealth is not a black and white issue. I think Ray Ortland, in his commentary on Proverbs, summarizes this point well when he writes, In Proverbs, poverty because of injustice is no disgrace. But poverty because of laziness is. You see the difference in those two ideas. There are some people in this life who will work just as hard, if not harder, than other people, and they won't 
prosper. For, for a host of reasons, they won't have as much as other people do in spite of their hard work. And there are others who will have more than they could ever need, and it has nothing to do with their willingness to work hard. And again, when Proverbs tells us that hard work leads to prosperity, it's providing us with a guideline. This is generally true. But we need to be careful about drawing a one-to-one between someone's spiritual life and the amount of money in their bank account. Proverbs is not saying if you're wealthy, it's because God is prospering you, so your spiritual life must be good. And if you don't have much, something must be wrong with your relationship with God. Rather, when we look through Proverbs, when we look through the entire Bible, what do we discover? There are rich, righteous people, and there are rich, wicked people. There are poor, righteous people, and there are poor, wicked people. And we see both extremes in the Bible. Now, given the choice between riches and God, Proverbs always tells us to choose God. Proverbs 15, 16, and 17, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs, Proverbs writes, where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Again, Proverbs reminds us at the end of the day, it's better to have God and nothing else than to have everything and not God. And so as we think through this, if our only path to prosperity is to turn our back on God, is to be disobedient to Him, is to gain that wealth in a way that God would not approve of, Proverbs says, stay faithful to God. Don't be distracted by the riches. And this brings us back to the prayer of Proverbs 30 where we'll spend the rest of our time. Now, if you're looking for like really practical help on how to handle finances and how to budget and how to invest, we have a handful of people at City of God who are really good in that area who would be happy to sit down with you and spend some time. What Proverbs wants to offer us today is this. What should the heart behind our finances be? What kind of mindset should we have as we think about the resources that God has given us? Let's go back and read that prayer together in Proverbs 30. Again, verses 8 and 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. What is Agur's point in this text? Whatever your financial situation is as you sit here this morning, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, each situation presents unique challenges to our relationship with God. And where this threshold is for you probably varies person to person. Agar had the self-awareness to say, if I have too much, it's not going to be good for my relationship with God. And if I have too little, it's not going to be good for my relationship with God. And so, he, God, just give me what I need to live the life that you're calling me to live. And there are some very wealthy people in this church. There are some very poor people in this church. My guess is most of us are somewhere in the middle of that tension. Regardless of your current financial circumstances, there are spiritual dangers we have to watch out for if we're not thinking about our resources or our resource challenges correctly because, and this is the reason this is stressed in Proverbs, it's way too easy to trust in our wealth to do the things for us that only God can do for us. It's easy to turn money into an idol. For both rich and poor, how often do we look at money as our primary source of security or identity or value or worth? quite frankly, as our salvation in the language of Scripture. How often do we find ourselves thinking, if I just had more, then I'd be happy. If I just had as much as them. If I just had this amount in the bank, then I could rest. Then I could get on with the rest of my life. And if that's our approach to our resources, we have turned money into an idol, believing it can provide us with things that only God can provide us with. Pastor Tim Keller helpfully identifies the things we're tempted to worship as idols in this way. When anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it is essentially an idol, he writes, something you're actually worshiping. And again, how easy is it for a certain amount of money or a certain kind of lifestyle 
to be our absolute requirement for happiness. And so the obvious question is, well, how do we keep from trusting in money like a God? How do we keep from expecting money to satisfy us in a way that only God can? First, we find Agar here praying, God, don't give me too much. Just give me the food that is needful for me. And if we're being honest, I doubt this is a prayer many of us have ever prayed. God, bless me, not too much. That's Hagar's prayer. God, bless me, just enough, not way out of proportion. And he prays this prayer because here's what he understands. If I'm wealthy, there's going to be some unique challenges to my relationship with God, which might sound strange to us. And I think part of the reason it sounds strange is because potentially we've become blind to the threat that excess can have to our spiritual life. It doesn't have to, but it can. What is the threat? Agar prays this. The threat is if I have too much, I'm prone to forget about my need for God. I'm prone to forget Him. And let's be honest for a second. As we think back to the past week or month of our life, how much were we really dependent on God for in a given day? That when Jesus goes to his disciples and tells them, pray to God, give us today our daily bread, they prayed that prayer because they needed God to give them food day by day if they were going to survive. But that's not our current experience. How do we depend on and trust in God when we have fridges and freezers and savings accounts and IRAs and homes that are ever growing and storage units? What do we actually need God for on a given day? I'm not saying any of those things are bad. I have most of them. They do present spiritual obstacles, though, if we're not careful. And so as we think through this, unless we're careful, our prosperity will become a stumbling block to our relationship with God. Again, if we're being honest, many of us already have more than we could ever need or use, and it hasn't made us happier. It hasn't satisfied us. I read an article this week vacationing in the British Virgin Islands with his family. Magazine editor William Falk found himself longing for a simple life. Gazing across the water, a little island caught his attention, and he learned that the population was known for enjoying a carefree lifestyle. Falk decided that's where he wanted to go. He confessed, I have no real wants. If anything, my life is too full. That's precisely the problem, author Greg Easterbrook says in his book, The Progress Paradox. Most Americans enjoy a higher standard of living than 99.4% of the 80 billion human beings who have ever lived, and yet we're not content. Our lives are characterized by too much of a good thing, Easterbrook writes, excess at every turn. We're surrounded by so much food that obesity has become a national crisis. We're tempted so much by entertainment and information and stuff to buy, we sleep three hours a day less than our grandparents. At times, it leaves you staring at a four-mile long island on the horizon, wondering what it would be like to chuck it all. Again, if we're not careful, the excess of our culture poses one of the single biggest threats to our relationship with God because it blinds us to our need for Him. Just to be clear, it's not a sin to have wealth. It's not a sin to be wealthy. There's righteous, wealthy people in Scripture. But in the midst of that wealth, one of the things many of us have to recognize is if we're not careful, our wealth will drown out our need for God or our dependence on Him day by day. And so the question is, how do we fight against this impulse for our prosperity to root a need for God out of our hearts? Well, the first thing we can do is this, is that we can remember our daily needs are not just practical physical needs. We also have spiritual needs. We need God to help us meet every day. John puts it this way in 1 John 1, 9 through 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Part of the reason I think we struggle to see our daily need for God is we don't see our sin clearly enough. Or we've misunderstood the goal of the Christian life. 
Again, we're going to key in on this over the course of the fall, but the moment we put our hope and trust in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Our disobedience to God and to His Word, past, present, and future, Jesus paid for on the cross. Jesus took on Himself. He took the judgment of God that we should have at the end of this life. And the moment we put our hope and trust in Jesus, we are forgiven and we're adopted into the family of God. But for some, that's where the Christian life ends. But what we see in Scripture is this, is that that's actually the starting point for the good work that God wants to do in us. He wants to transform us into the image of Christ, make us into the people He created us to be. And what that requires is a day-by-day repenting of sin and turning from disobedience in God and depending on His mercy and His grace and His power to change us into the people that He created us to be. And when that is the end goal, when the end goal of the Christian life is not, I trusted in Jesus, so now I'm not going to hell, and I'll go to heaven when I die. And it becomes, now that I'm following Jesus, He wants to progressively transform me into His image over the course of my life. I absolutely have something I need daily from God because... I cannot become that person on my own. And so we have to make sure our our focus is right to see our daily spiritual need, to depend on Him. However, we also fight the power of wealth to cause us to forget God by using the resources that God has given us for His purposes. In Ephesians 4.28, Paul writes, "...let the thief no longer steal." But rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. What is the reason God blesses some with wealth? So they can meet their own needs, so they can take care of the people around them. Yes, so they can even enjoy it to a degree. We see elements of that in the Bible. But also so that they're able to give to those in need. When the person who doesn't have enough comes to God and asks Him, give me my daily bread, provide me with what I need to get through this life, one of the ways that God wants to answer that prayer is through the generosity of His people. We just said if God's goal for our life is to progressively look more like Jesus and sound more like Jesus and act more like Jesus, it's helpful to discover we rarely look more like Christ than when we're living generously and sacrificially with the people around us. Because when you look at the example of Jesus, you discover He has been so much more generous with us than we could ever be with Him or the people around us. Paul phrased it this way in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you, by His poverty, might become rich. Think of all that Christ gave up so that we could have a relationship with God, leaving His existence in heaven and the relationship He had with the Father from the beginning, coming to this fallen world to live as a human being, to experience not only the daily hardships of life, but the suffering that He would undergo on the cross, taking the sins of mankind on Himself. And when you see the trade that Jesus made from the life He had to the life He adopted so that we might be made right with God, you see the generosity of Jesus. You see how much He gave up to come and to serve us and to give His life for us. And so if we're someone who's been blessed by Christ in this way, who's been given so much, the question we ask to fight What prosperity can do in our life is to pick up Jesus' example of being generous with the people around us, of meeting needs of the people around us. And so a question we ask as followers of Jesus is, where are we sacrificing for others? Where are we feeling the pinch of our generosity for the sake of other people? Again, there's few better ways to become like Christ or to remember Christ in the midst of prosperity than by meeting the needs of people around us. 
for those who are in need or for those who do need to pray to God to meet their most basic needs. Again, you may be God's answer to their prayer request. What a privilege that is. However, having too much is not the only condition that can put us in spiritual peril. Not having enough can be equally dangerous. And again, this sounds odd to us, but what does Agur say here? Or lest I be poor in steel and profane the name of God. There's two things he's worried about. If I don't have enough, one, I might be tempted to disobey God to try and meet my needs. I might be tempted to take my life in my own hands. And even if I had to, to cut corners and to cheat and to lie and to steal to meet my basic needs. And if someone doesn't have their basic needs met, we can easily understand how they would get to that place. And it's just as easy for those who already have plenty to resort to these kinds of things to try and get more. But Agar's concern is, God, if I don't have enough, I'm going to be tempted to take my life into my own hands, which might mean disobeying your word and your will to satisfy my needs. But Agar's also worried that if he doesn't have enough, he might be tempted to curse God. God, I'm praying, I'm asking, I'm trusting. Why won't you give me what I need? What good is a God who can't meet my needs? This is the fear that Agar has, that he'll begin to feel resentment or bitterness toward God if he doesn't have enough. And if that's the temptation we're facing this morning, the temptation of feeling like we don't have enough, what are we told to do? We're told to continue to trust and to continue to believe and to pray and to work hard and to be diligent and to press into God's people who may be able to provide for us. And again, this might not lead to the life that we want or the life that we thought it would be, but we really do believe and trust that God will provide us with what we need to live the life he's calling us to live. Again, Agur recognized if he had too much or too little, this could be a problem in his spiritual life. And so he prays, give me what I need every day. Help me be content with what you have supplied me with. I'll close with this and the band can come up and we're going to sing in just a second. What we discover a little later in Scripture is this. Whether we have a lot or whether we have little, The secret to living the life that God has called us to live is actually the same thing. Paul tells us this in Philippians 4. Toward the end of the book, he writes these words, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Notice he describes facing plenty like a challenge to be faced, facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, Paul reveals that he's lived the full spectrum of human experience. He's had plenty, and he's had little. He's lived in uh, palaces, and he's had nowhere to lay his head. We've seen the gamut in Paul's life. And in both extremes, he writes, the secret to living the Christian life, the secret to finding joy is to recognize that the same Christ is available to anyone going through either extreme and that the same Jesus is sufficient to meet the challenges of either circumstance. That Paul comes to recognize, when I didn't have much, Jesus was the thing that would satisfy me and sustain me. And when I had more than I needed, Jesus was the thing that satisfied and sustained me. And here's what we come to realize. If we're not satisfied and content with Jesus in our current financial situation, we won't be satisfied with him in a better financial situation. This is the challenge of Paul in Philippians. Whatever the situation, whatever you're facing, whatever's in your bank account right now, Jesus is the thing that satisfies you and sustains you and brings you joy and peace and comfort and purpose. And for all of the good our resources can do, they can't provide us with that. 
This is the heart of wisdom as we seek to live in this world and in this culture. We're called to turn our eyes to Christ and to treasure him above everything else. I'll pray and we'll sing.